Well, good morning. Uh, let me add my, my welcome. It's great to see you. We do trust as we... Morning, John. We do trust as we uh, study God's Word together that we'll be blessed and hear God's voice. As, as Bruce has already mentioned, we are making our way through Mark's Gospel on Sunday mornings, and we are in Mark chapter 2, verse 18, going through to verse 12 of chapter 3. Uh, religion versus the gospel is the title that I have put over this passage of Scripture. Okay, so let's read the passage through together. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Now John's disciples, it's John the Baptist, and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath, Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, we pray that your spirit would speak to each and every heart bowed in your presence. Lord, may you fill our vision with Jesus. We ask it for his glory and in his name. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate throwing things out. I'm a bit of a hoarder, and I struggle to let go of things from the past. The collection I've amassed at home is unbelievable. I have books, old school textbooks, football sticker albums. You may remember those records, medals, clothes, 
notes, sketches, you name it, I've kept it. Now, I know a lot of it is junk, but I won't let go. Why? Because there's a memory or there's a connection with the past, and I want to hold on to it. Maybe it's a male thing. I don't know. But this also brings conflict at home. Conflict with others who don't have a problem letting go of the past. Indeed, they have no problem clearing out cupboards, clearing out the loft at a whim, and letting go of stuff from the past and sending it to the skip. Now, here in Mark chapter 2, we meet the Pharisees. And they too are hoarders, but in a different sense. They struggle with letting go of the past, and it brings them into conflict with Jesus. You see, the Pharisees were a very influential group amongst the religious leaders of the Jews. And they had taken God's law given to Moses, and over a period of, say, nearly 200 years, they had added thousands and thousands of their own rules and regulations, making God's law unrecognizable and turning it into their own law. And they had turned God's holy and perfect law into an empty form of man-made religion placing heavy burdens on people. Their lives became a constant box-ticking exercise, checking off against all the rules and regulations. I must do this. I must do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. Now, Jesus, early on in His ministry, He begins to expose the Pharisees and their empty religion. You see, Jesus has come to bring a new beginning for all humanity. Jesus has come to bring a new beginning with God that's not based on keeping rules and regulations. It's based on faith, faith in Jesus Christ. And this puts Jesus on a head-on collision course with the Pharisees, who in true hoarder style want to cling on to the past and not give up their empty and dead religion. You see, some things deserve to be sent to the skip. And man-made religion, in whatever its form, is one of those things. Now, when we come to Mark chapter 2, the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees, it escalates, it grows. Now, from the beginning of chapter 2, right down to to verse 6 of chapter 3, if you read that passage through, you'll discover there are five conflict stories between Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, the first story um, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, it's where Jesus heals the paralytic man. You may remember a few weeks ago um, how he was lowered down through the roof, and Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. Now they were there, the religious leaders were there, and they were watching Jesus. And in verse 6 of chapter 2, we are told what they're thinking. What they're thinking. Who does this Jesus think he is? He's a blasphemer. Only God can forgive sins. Now in the second, third, and fourth stories, the conflict develops. And it's no longer just their thoughts. Now it's their words, and they begin to verbally attack and question Jesus. The second story, verses 13 to 17 of chapter 2, they begin to question Jesus about the company he keeps. Look at verse 16. The scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? The third story, verses 18 to 23, they question Jesus about fasting. 
The fourth story, verses 23 to 28, they question Jesus about the Sabbath. Look at verse 24. The Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now we come to the fifth conflict story, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And it's no longer just their thoughts and what they're thinking. It's no longer just their words. Now it's action. Look at verse 6. When Jesus heals the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath, in verse 6 we read, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. They wanted rid of Jesus. They wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted him dead. And just look at the lengths that they were prepared to go to, plotting with the Herodians, whom they despised. They hated the Herodians. They were the liberals. They were pro-Roman. This was like the Labour Party to the, the, the Pharisees' conservatives. They just wouldn't work together unless it was for a common purpose and for their own good. And Jesus was seen by both as a threat. Now, what caused this conflict to escalate to this level? Well, it's important to understand this. That it wasn't just about the issue of fasting. It wasn't just about the issue of keeping the Sabbath. The fundamental issue, the fundamental dispute at the heart of this conflict was this. It's about how God forgives sin. And how God brings sinners, like me, like you, into a relationship with Himself. For the Pharisees, this was through their religion. Acceptance with God was based on your ability to keep all the rules and regulations. In other words, you had to earn it. Work at it. Jesus says, no, you, you can't earn it. Acceptance with God is not by your works. It is only by God's grace. It's a gift. God in His, His kindness and in His heart of love, He's given us this gift of forgiveness, this gift of salvation. You receive it by faith in Jesus Christ. So the heart of this conflict, religion, Works-based religion versus the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in our passage, we're going to see, and Samuel, maybe you could put up the next slide, please. But we're going to see three key areas where the gospel of Jesus Christ differs from religion. And by the way, this is true of all religion. First of all, chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, Jesus brings people into joy, and religion doesn't. Secondly, from verses 23 to 28, Jesus shows mercy to people in their need, and religion doesn't. And then thirdly, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, Jesus brings people into blessing, and religion doesn't. So let's look at the first point. Jesus brings people into joy. Here they are. Here, here's the Pharisees. And uh, they come in verse 18. They ask the question, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now, fasting was part of their rules and regulations. The, fast, the Pharisees had introduced a twice-weekly fast Firstly on a Monday and then on a Thursday. And everyone had to know that you were fasting. You know, the focus was on the externals. You know, look at me, I'm more pious than you, I, I, I'm fasting. Jesus had them, had them rumbled. Look at, at Matthew chapter 6, Jesus um, he talks about fasting in verse 16. He says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. It was all a sham. 
Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father. Now, the issue is not fasting. You know, Jesus is not condemning fasting. The point here is that there is a time to fast. And Jesus says, now is not the time. Jesus says, this isn't the time for sorrow. This is a time for joy. Look at verse 19. Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? He describes himself as the bridegroom. The bridegroom at a wedding. A wedding is a time for for great joy, isn't it? It's a time for feasting. It's a time for celebration. My daughter got married uh, during the summer. And it was a time of great joy. It was also a time of great expense. And when I think about that, there there was some sorrow associated with it. Especially when you had to pay the bill at the end. But it was a time of great joy. Can you imagine the the atmosphere at the wedding, at the, the reception, at the dinner, if the guests refused the food? No, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm fasting. Or if they sat with faces like thunder, not just during my speech, but if if they sat with faces like thunder, ashen-faced, and turned up as if they were going to a funeral, it's just completely the wrong occasion. You see, genuine fasting in the Bible is associated with seeking God's presence and mourning over sin. And there are times when we should fast. But Jesus says, now is not the time to fast. Because God is here. God is present among you. You don't need to seek God's presence because the bridegroom is here. I'm here, says Jesus. I am God and I have come that you might know the joy of sins forgiven. Now Jesus goes on and he says in verse 20, there will be a time to fast. Look at verse 20. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Jesus here, he's pointing forward. He's pointing forward to his arrest when he will be taken away, when he will go to face the cross where he will face the horror of the cross, where he will face the judgment of God upon himself for our sin. And this is why we can know the joy of sins forgiven. This is why God can save you and me, because Jesus passed through the unimaginable sorrow of being punished by God for our sin. This is religion versus the gospel. Jesus brings people into joy, the joy of sins forgiven, the joy of a right relationship with God. Religion brings no such joy. It is powerless to forgive our sin. It is powerless to restore us to God. Let's move on to the second point. Jesus shows mercy to people in their need, but religion doesn't. This takes us to verses 23 to 28. And now the Pharisees, they they question Jesus about the Sabbath. Jesus here is walking with his disciples, walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples start to pluck the the heads of the grain to eat. They they must have been hungry. And it's quite a a happy scene. But the Pharisees are there. Whether they were, you know, dressed up in trees following Jesus around, I don't know. But they seem to just follow Jesus, scrutinizing everything that he does and says. And they're there. And they're waiting to pounce. And in verse 24, here they come with their question. Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Your disciples are breaking the rules. Pointing the finger. Well, you know, they weren't actually. 
What the disciples were doing was perfectly legitimate. Under Deuteronomy 23, 25, it, it was okay for you to pluck the ears of grain from your neighbor's field, so long as you didn't take a sickle to it. You know, if, if your neighbor has an apple tree, then you can take an apple, but you can't go into the, the garage with your chainsaw and take the tree down and, you know, a little bit was okay. But that's not how the Pharisees saw it. You see, they were looking at the Sabbath through all their rules and regulations that they had added to God's Sabbath. And to them, the disciples, because they had taken grain in their fingers, to them, under their rules and regulations, they were guilty of reaping and therefore working on the Sabbath. That's how ridiculous it had become. Now, Jesus is so wise in how he handles the Pharisees. He takes them back to the Old Testament, to the Scriptures, and he takes them to an episode from the life of David, before David was king, when David and his men were in desperate need, being hunted by King Saul, fearing for their lives, and in desperate need of food. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. David and his men ate of the bread of the presence, the holy bread, as it's described in, in the Bible. The bread that, that sat in the presence of God in the tabernacle. Only the priests were allowed to eat this bread, but David and his men were in need. Now the point Jesus is making here is this. That God was more interested in David's need being met than in a technical point of law being observed. David's need was greater than the ceremonial law and that just tells you something about the kind of God God is. Now when you come to Matthew's record of this incident, Jesus actually quotes scripture to the Pharisees. And he, and he quotes from the book of Hosea. And in that passage, God says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I will have mercy. Mercy. God had mercy upon David in his need. God is a God who is rich in mercy. What does that mean? Well, in the words of Psalm 103, verse 10, God does not treat us as we deserve to be treated. God does not treat us sinners as we sinners deserve to be treated. Jesus came to show God's mercy to us. To show God's mercy in our need, in our sin. And that the punishment that should have fallen upon us fell on Jesus. And God had mercy upon us and sent Jesus to save us from our sins. This is religion versus the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus shows us God's mercy. Religion offers no mercy. It is a cold, hard system of rules and regulations with no heart nor love for people in their need. We see it in the attitude of the Pharisees. They condemned the disciples even when they had not broken God's law. And they would have closed their heart to David and his men in their need. Praise God how different the gospel of Jesus Christ is where Jesus meets us in our need. Third and final point, Jesus brings people into blessing and religion does not. 
This takes us to chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, where Jesus heals the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. Now, before we get to chapter 3, we need to think about what Jesus says at the end of chapter 2. Because Jesus here lays down an important principle about the Sabbath. Look at verses 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was written into creation by God for all humanity. It wasn't just for Israel. And it was given by God to all mankind as a blessing. God never intended the Sabbath to be a burden. It was to be a blessing and a benefit. The word itself in Hebrew, Shabbat, it means rest. A rest from work. But more than that, it was to be a Sabbath unto the Lord your God. For man to rest in God. To rest in the presence of God. To worship God. That, that's the purpose of the Sabbath. Now the Pharisees had turned the Sabbath into a burden. Not a blessing. All these rules and regulations, they had missed the entire point of the Sabbath and they had misrepresented the heart of God. Now look at verse 28. Jesus makes a declaration of his authority. So the Son of Man, says Jesus, is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus uses this title, the Son of Man. He, he used it earlier in chapter 2 and verse 10. And it's a, a title that's associated with his authority. And it's actually got nothing to do really with his humanity. It's more to do with his deity. In, chapter, in, in, in verse 10 of chapter 2, he says, The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. You see, his authority comes from God because that's who he is. It takes us back to Daniel chapter 7 where Daniel saw uh, the, the Son of Man, some, someone who was in human form, and he approaches the presence of God and he is given authority and dominion of an everlasting kingdom. The Son of Man has the authority of God because that's exactly who he is. And Jesus declares his authority. He is Lord of the Sabbath because he made it. And now in chapter 3, he gives a demonstration of his authority over the Sabbath. He heals this man with a withered hand. Probably a, a, some kind of shriveled hand. Which probably limited the work that this man could do. Most of the work, I guess, would have been manual, manual labor. So this man was probably unable to work. And Jesus says to the man, come here. And now in verse 4, Jesus asks the $64,000 question. He says to the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? They were silent. It says it all. They had no answer. And in full view of these cold-hearted Pharisees, Jesus demonstrates that he is Lord of the Sabbath. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of heart, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. It was probably the one thing the man couldn't do by himself. Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Jesus brings this man into blessing. And Jesus restores this man to the position that God had made him to be originally in creation. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins, 
He has the authority to restore us into that relationship with God that God intended us to have at creation. This is religion versus the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus brings joy. Jesus shows mercy. Religion does not. Jesus brings people into blessing. Religion does not. The Pharisees would not give up their religion. A religion that would have kept this man in his weakness and infirmity. A religion that would have ignored David's need. A religion that would have fasted at a time of joy. What a miserable existence. Would you rather have religion or Jesus? The sad thing is that many people, even today, still prefer to cling to religion that keeps them in their sin and keeps them at a distance from God when they could enjoy a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and all the blessings that that brings. One final point just to make on this passage, and with this I close. You cannot mix the gospel of Jesus Christ with religion. You cannot have faith in Jesus plus religion. You cannot have faith in Jesus plus anything else. And this is the point Jesus makes in verses 20. 21 and 22 of chapter 2. Jesus says, No one sews a piece, piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. New wine is for fresh wineskins. You cannot patch Jesus onto a broken religion. Jesus gives us new wine. You cannot pour the wine of God's grace into the rigid, lifeless wineskins of empty religion. It is all of God's grace. There is nothing of us. There is nothing of self. There is nothing that you can do to earn or work for God's salvation. You rest on the work and person of Jesus Christ. And I give my life to Him. And I put my faith in Him. Just as I am. Just as I am. Without one plea but that your blood was shed for me. Just as I am, you will receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because your promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that in Jesus Christ there is life there is joy, there is forgiveness with you, there are blessings untold. Thank you that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Thank you that he did not come to give us a series of rules and regulations or for us to sign up to a religion. We thank you that he came to call us to himself, to give our lives to him, to follow him by faith. Father, we just pray that you would open every eye here in this gathering to see Jesus in all his glory and all his beauty, to see him for who he really is, the Son of Man, God become man. Father, we owe him everything. And may we live that out in our lives day by day before you. We just ask that you would speak to us we ask that we would respond through your Spirit, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. 
Amen.